Tevet. It's not the tenth of Tevet. As you can see at the beginning, top of page 1006, it says, Slichot said on the fast days. What are the fast days? Um, Tisha B'Av is one. And the, thank you so much, David. We're, we're live. We're learning about the special additions to the prayers on the fast days, the Shiva Sarba Tammuz today, 17th of Tammuz. And on page 1006, it says we add something called Slichot. But there are some exceptions. Of course, on Tisha B'Av, we don't say the Slichot. Instead, we say Kinot, which is a separate book. We'll look at that in three weeks' time, or two and a half weeks, uh, before to get you ready beforehand. Um, so, but this is Slichot for the 10th of Tevet. Uh, we said there are four days, four fast days for the destruction. We commemorate the destruction of the temple. So the first section here is for the fast of the 10th month. That's Tevet. We have to flip a few pages forward. And then on page 1018, see Slichot for the fast of Esther. That's an additional fifth fast day, which we didn't talk about now. We'll talk about it before Purim. Uh, but there is actually a fifth fast day. It's kind of a strange fast. It's not about the destruction of the temple. It's called the Fast of Esther. It commemorates the fast which Esther fasted before the, before the uh, redemption of, of the Purim story uh, in the book of Esther. If you turn ahead, even past 1018, and go all the way to 1030, 1030, 1030, 1030, yeah, that's code for. It's actually 10:40 on CB, CBA. I think it's 10:40. Good, good, buddy. 10:30. We have slichot for the 17th of Tammuz. We found it. I don't know if you managed this morning to find the slichot quick enough to follow along. There's a different tradition in Sephardic tradition, Ashkenazic tradition. There's all sorts of different prayers added in, but everybody adds in something special. These are the Ashkenazi Slichot. It starts off with, as you can see, Slachna, forgive us for our father, and then Keler Chapayim, you are God slow to anger, which is the introduction to the 13 attributes of mercy. You see the beginning of the next paragraph, from Exodus 34, Hashem Hashem, the Lord, the Lord, compassionate, gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. We only say that with a minyan, and we have a few... Uh, standard prayers for forgiveness, a collection of verses, and then when you turn to the next page, <coughs> page 1032, the structure is of the slichot, at least according to the Ashkenazi custom, but also according to the Sephardi tradition, is that we have a, a repetition of the 13 attributes of mercy from Exodus 34, over and over and over again. In between, we have individual passages, individual prayers. This one on 1032, I want you to take a look at because it'll bring us, this is the Ashkenazi, right? It talks actually about the character of the day. Okay, Gavriel, read for us, please, in the middle of the page, 1032, Atanu, we come before you. Yeah. Go ahead. We come before you, former of the winds, uh, in our many in iniquities, our sights have grown heavy. Uh, the decrees against us, powerful in our screen, so many. For on the 17th of Tammuz, the tablets were smashed. Okay, so we have reason number one for yeah. fasting on the 17th of Tammuz. This is the day. We associate it with the breaking of the tablets. It's good review for us, right? Keep going. He lists all the five different reasons. It's fascinating. Within our prayers, we pray to Hashem and we remind ourselves why we are fasting. Go ahead. We've been exiled. Oh, okay. Uh, we have been exiled from the house of your choosing. Our judgment was sealed. The decree laid down. And the light has darkened over us. As we learned last week, we're not quite sure when this, what the story was with the Torah scroll being burned, but uh, there is a passage towards the end of the Second Temple where there was this township, the Romans, the Roman soldiers, before the actual destruction, 
they took and uh, desecrated a Sefer Torah, and there was a, a tremendous uh, outcry, and uh, the soldier was punished, but uh, in the end of the day, this was a significant stage in the destruction of the Second Temple. According to most interpretations, that's when it happened. So we have reason number two. Go ahead. Our enemies destroyed the sanctuary. The divine presence fled from its corner, and, and we were yielded up to the hands of the one time uh, to be consumed. For on the 17th of Tammuz, an idol was set up in the temple. Ah, an idol was set up in the temple. Reason number three. Keep going. We were scattered from city to city, uh, and old and young of us were seized. The place of our delight was destroyed, and the fire raged through her. For on the 17th of Tammuz, the city was broken through. Reason number four, right? We said the breaching of the walls. The mm -hmm. link of foe took hold of, the of our temple, but and the Caribs, bride and bridegroom, were deprived of all their uh, ornaments. Because we angered you, uh, and we were, uh, we were giving up to destruction. But on the 17th of the moons, the daily offering ceased. Okay, we have the, is that the fourth or the fifth? Fifth already? Reason? Fourth? Yeah. Daily offering ceased. Okay, so we have reason number four. Keep going. All glory and praise work is that endless. That the enemy drew his sword and brandished uh, its point against us. Small children and babies prepared for the slaughter. For the, on the seventeenth of Tammuz, the offerings and the offerings and sacrifices ceased. Right. So this is um, referring to what we said that um, towards the end of the of the first temple, the sacrifices stopped. Um, and so we have all five reasons. And uh, he goes on to poetically use this refrain, for on the 17th of Tammuz, um, uh, sin decided our destiny. destiny. Look at the bottom of the page, the last two lines. We're going to skip a little bit. We've been dispersed and found no relief, so, and so our sides have multiplied within us. Rock! See how our souls have been bowed low? Turn the page now to 1034. And turn our 17th of Tammuz into gladness and joy. We ask Hashem to please uh, change this day. As we can see, skip to the last line. Say to Zion, get up and turn our 17th of Tammuz to a day of salvation and comfort. That's it. We're hoping for it. We're praying for it. And then, lo and behold, we have an introductory passage too. Exodus 34, the 13 attributes of mercy punctuate uh, the, the prayer service called the Slichot. Next page, we're not going to read it all now, page 1036. This one really uh, needs a translation. The Hebrew is so difficult. But it also talks about what happened to us in Tammuz. <coughs> I don't know, uh, we're not going to go through it again. Um, it's, it's, it's written in very poetic language. And again, at the bottom, you see Exodus 34, the introductory passage, Kel Melech, God, King who sits upon the throne of compassion, acts with loving kindness. And then we recite 13 attributes of mercy, praying to Hashem to stop all the suffering historically associated with this day. The next passage, page 1038. 1038. In the middle of the page, you can see it's said responsively. Good morning. Here's a seagull for Eitan. Um, the punchline of every paragraph, can you see that in the middle of the page, is on the day the enemy prevailed and the city was broken through. Go down to the next paragraph. You can see it's written towards the right-hand margin. On the day the enemy prevailed and the city was broken through. Next. On the day the enemy prevailed and the, and the city was broken through. Also, at the end of the page, every paragraph has a refrain in the entire passage, and this is usually recited responsively. Chazan says it, then the Kahal says it, then the community says it out loud. And uh, again, they're all talking about... Uh, look, uh, look at the last paragraph on page 1038. The glory of my heart, my stronghold, will your rage fume forever? Will you not see this weary nation blackened as if by the furnace... 
close with the descendant of parrots, the breach of my fence. Close with the descendant of parrots, the breach of my fence. And from among the thorns, pick out the lily. Who's the lily among the thorns? It's an expression from the Song of Songs. The Jewish people are considered to be the lily among the thorns, the flower, the rose. But all around us are prickly thorns of the persecutions in the exile. And then, once again, for the last time, on page 1040, see, we've been going for 10 pages of slichot. On page 1040, we have the 13 attributes of mercy again, compassionate, gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and kindness and truth. Forgive us our iniquity and our sin, and take, him, take us as our inheritance. And then we have a list of verses from Psalms, which all start with the word zechor, zechor, zechor. Remember, Lord, your compassion and loving kindness. Next page we're going to skip. I want to show you one more thing, which uh, we're not going to go through the entire uh, slichot service, except to go to page 1050. Another it's full 10 pages. 1050. There's two passages here with a repetition. Let's do it in Hebrew. El Rachum Shemecha, El Chanun Shemecha, Banu Nikra Shemecha. Compassionate God is your name, gracious God is your name, we are called by your name, Lord. Act for the sake of your name. And then we say, Hashem, Ase Leman Shemecha, Ase Leman Amitach. What is the word Amitach in the second line of the Hebrew in 10? 51 starts with the letter Aleph, and then we say, Ase Leman Beritach, 1051, page 1051, second line in Hebrew. And then what's the next one? Ase Leman, Leman, God Lach Vatifartach, starts with the Gimel, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, you see the pattern? Ase Leman Datach, the third line now. Act for the sake of your uh, law. Seleman Hodach. Hey, Alef Bet Gimel Dalit. Hey, do you see that? We go through the entire alphabet and saying, act, turning to Hashem and asking Him, act for the sake of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. Right? I don't know how to count, uh, how to say the letters of the alphabet in Chinese. I don't know if there is an equivalent, but uh, it's, it's more. It works a little differently in Chinese, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. It says, this is a very ancient prayer. Very, very ancient. It goes way back to the times of the Second Temple. This ase liman, act for the sake of. This refrain, this repetition. Ase liman, act for the sake of. For the sake of X, Y, and Z. All the way down from A, B, C to X, Y, and Z. The next paragraph, the bottom of page 1050, answer us. And if you're with us on the, uh, the trip to Tiveria, I started singing it for you. Anenu Eloe Abraham. Anenu. It's in the middle of the paragraph there. Of course, we also go through the Aleph Bet first. If you notice in the first line, after Anenu Hashem Anenu Elokeinu Anenu, Anenu Avinu. Avinu Aleph. Anenu Boreinu. Bet, second line. Anenu goaleinu anenu. We say the answer us before the word and the anenu after after the word. Dorshenu, hayel neman. Vatik. We go through the aleph bet and then we get to Eloke Abraham, and finally, um, we say the anenu for Eloke Abraham, Eloke Yitzchak. And the Sephardic version has anenu elahad meir, the God of light or meir. Perhaps Rabbi Meir Balanes is what we spoke about in Tiveria. Next page also. These are one of the most ancient uh, formulations of prayers that we have from the Second Temple times, explicitly mentioned in the Mishnah. Misha ana la Avram Avinu ba'ara Moria hu Page 1052. The one who answered Avram, our father, and Mamariah, answer us. We go through history. Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, you see that? Yosef, the one who answered our fathers at the Reed Sea, answer us. The answer who answered Moshe and Chorev. The one who answered Aaron over his fire pan. What, when was that? When did he answer Aaron over his fire pan? I'm on line 10. Page what, 1052? Line 10. Anybody, please? 
the one who answered Aaron over his fire pan. Hirsch, I need your help. The other students are not getting it quick enough. Ravid, help me out. When was Aaron answered over his fire pan? Eitan, come on. No. Aaron and his fire pan. During what? It wasn't too long ago. We read it in the Torah. After Korach, that's right, there was a, there was a plague. And the people were dying. And Moshe told Aaron, take the fire pan with the incense and run into the people. And stop the plague. That's it. So we go through then. The next one you should know, hopefully this one you'll get. The one who answered Pinchas when he stood up from among the congregation. Answer us. When was that? Okay, that's this week's Parsha, right? That was the beginning. It's called Parsha Pinchas because it, the, it was at the end of last week's Parsha where he, he uh, took care of business and stopped the plague when the Jewish people were sinning. Uh, with the daughters of Moab, right? Mm -hmm. And then we go on throughout history. Joshua, Gilgal, Shamuot, Mitzpah, David and Solomon. You've got to know your, you gotta know your Tanakh. Mm -hmm. Eliyahu on Mount Carmel. You've heard of that one, right? If Who's, I'm not mistaken, it's, it's one of my favorite stories. Who was he fighting against? Eliyahu on Mount Carmel. Do you know where Mount Carmel is? It's in the north. It's in the Galil, no? That's right. It's in the Golan. Not the Golan. And it's not quite the Galil either. I'm going there on a family vacation about a month from today. During the break, plan the family vacation. We're going to go camping in the mountains of Carmel. Eliyahu has an encounter, a competition against the prophets of the Baal. You got to know your Tanakh guys. Next, Elisha at Jericho. Oh, did we recognize Elisha? It was in this week's Haftarah. Boy, you guys must have been sleeping through the Torah reading and the Haftarah. After I spoke about Eliyahu appointing his successor, what did he do to appoint Elisha as his successor? What did he do to appoint Elisha as his successor? He threw his cloak over him. The cloak of Elijah. Next, uh, a Jonah in the belly of the fish. You know that story, right? Oh, okay. Yechezkiyahu, the king of Judah, in his illness. He was going to die. And he prays Hashem cures him from his illness. Who are Hanania, Mishael, and Azariah? Anybody know their Persian names? These were the young boys that were in Persian captivity. They were given other names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego actually met people named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, believe it or not. Hananiah is more common, Mishael also, but not the, not the Persian names. Anyway, Daniel, you know, and we go through all Jewish history, and we end up, and then if you look at the bottom of the page, after this Lichot, special feature of the uh, the uh, prayer service on fast days, Avinu Malkeinu. So now we got to go back and look for it on page 202. Why is it there? Because during the 10 days of repentance, we say the Avinu Malkeinu every single day, 10 days in a row. And that's... Four months. An entire month you say the Avinu Malkeinu? The Sephardic. The Sephardic? Oh, yeah. The month of Elul, the month of Slichot, the month of Elul. It's coming up in two months. Yeah. Just one month, really. 
have a month and a half. Now we're in Tammuz, then comes Av, then comes Elul. The high holidays are upon us. Comes quickly. Page 202. Avinu Malkeinu. Our father, our king. Also, one of these very old formulations of prayers mentioned by the Tanaim as a prayer said <laughs> on the fast days, on the fast days commemorating the destruction, but also the fast days that they used to declare when there was a drought and there's not enough rain. Um, Avinu Malkeinu. It's as you can see, every line starts with the words Avinu Malkeinu, our father, our king. We have a relationship with Hashem in many different ways. And there's a list of um, the one I've been saying in the last few years. It's five lines from the end of the page, four lines from the end of the page. Our father, our king, withhold the plague from your heritage. Or, some people say, prevent. Why have I been saying that more than ever? Because we've been living through a plague. During the pandemic, many rabbis said you should be reciting this prayer. Our father, a king, withhold the plague from your heritage. Along with the perhaps more famous line, on the next page, top of the next page, as you can see on top of page 204, the following verses are said responsively, first by the leader, then by the congregation, so it gives it a little more emphasis, more than the others. Our Father, our King, it's a traditional tune. Bring, back, bring us back to you in perfect repentance. And the next one, Avinu malkeinu shlach refuah shleima lechole amecha. What do you say to somebody who's sick? Refuah shleima. Remember I taught you that? Mm-hmm. Here it is. Refuah shleima. Complete healing to the sick of your people. And um, there's two different versions, as you can see, for the 10 days of repentance. Between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we recite them line uh, 6. Our Father, a King, write us in the Book of Good Life. Well, because there's a tradition that at that beginning of the year, God writes in the book for what's going to be the verdict, what's going to be the result of your year, your entire year. But now we're not in the middle of the year. So we go to the next paragraph. You can see on fast days, we change the language, and we don't say, write us in the Book of Good Life, but we say, remember us for a good life. Remember us for redemption. Remember us for livelihood. Remember us for merit. Remember us for pardon. Instead of, write us in the book, which is only said during the 10 days, the beginning of the year after Rosh Hashanah. And then we go on and recite the rest of the list of Vinu Malkeinu. Some people sing it. Page 206, there's a few which were added, I think, during the Crusades when there was horrible stuff those who were slaughtered for your proclaiming your unity, those who were killed for your holy name, have pity us, our children, our infants, avenge before our eyes the spilled blood of your servants, our Father, our King, act for your sake, if not for ours. Really heart-rending um, uh, petition. Then the last one is made famous by a beautiful, beautiful tune. You might know it. If you know it, you can join me. Avinu Malkeinu, the bottom of page 207. Choneinu Vaneinu, it's a kamatz katan, Hirsch. Avinu Malkeinu, Choneinu Vaneinu, Ki ein banu maasi. Ase imanu, Tzedaka v'chesed. Say, man, who said, Daka, Vachesed, Vehoshi. You might have heard about it, but, but you know, it's, it's a popular tune. Nice tune. Anyways, that's the Avinu Makena, which is added in on the fast days. We're going to also add it in 
If you look at Mincha time, Mincha time today, if you look on page 288, 298, excuse me, page 200, 300, and 4. Page 304 on the top of the page, the instructions say, just giving you a heads up. Mincha is going to be right after classes this morning, right? That uh, there's no lunch, so I think we'll have Mincha probably at one o'clock mm-hmm. between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and on fast days. You see the top top line on page three hundred and four? It says on fast days when Tachnun is not, except days when Tachnun is not said. Avinu Malkeinu on page 202 is said here. So once again this afternoon mm-hmm. in Mincha we're going to recite the Avinu Malkeinu like I was just showing you on page 202. Okay? Questions about the prayer service on, on the fast days? If none, so that we can continue. Let's open up the book called Zamanim from the Panini Halacha series. It's in, on the tables in front of you. Are, are you uh, telling us something about why we read uh, Torah today? Besimcha. All the fast days the messages uh, enacted that we have to recite, read from the Torah, even though it's not a Monday or Thursday. <coughs> There's a special reading on the fast days. You may have noticed what passage it is. What did we read from this morning? Exodus 34. Should come as no surprise. We quoted it five times in the Slichot prayer service as the refrain. The 13 attributes of mercy. God forgives the Jewish people for their great sin. We spoke about the sin. What happened? Exodus 34. What do the Jews need forgiveness for? The golden calf which of course is what we're commemorating on the 17th of Tammuz, the archetype of the sin of the Jewish people. Right after the revolution of Sinai, worshipping a golden calf becomes the archetype of the sin. And more so what we commemorate is that we're forgiven. Even though we sin, Hashem forgives us. Hashem is full of compassion. And 13 attributes of mercy that Hashem acts with us. Okay, if you look, turn to page 127. Can I ask you another please. question? Please. Yeah. When we read the Torah uh, one ago, if we put the uh, hold on the Torah. Right, and lift we, it up. We, we, we turn around. Yeah. Um, I recognize two times these uh, days when the one who's uh, holding up the Torah is going to the left side. Mm. Now I'm thinking, this is not okay. Interesting. When we hold it up, we can go to the right side. Is it true what I say, or I, I'm uh, mistaken? You're correct, but it's a little more complicated. The tradition says that whenever you, uh, the temp, the, the, of course, there was a very detailed service in, in the temple. The Kohanim had to do walk from here to here, slaughter the animal. Take the blood, sprinkle it just so, and you know, take the innards, skin the... There was a, a, a very precise ritual. One of the rules of the ritual in the, of the Kohen in the, in the Beit HaMikdash, which of course is the pattern for how we're going to serve Hashem, is that it says whenever the Kohen turns, he always turns to the right. Because right, we mentioned, represents might. I think we talked about it last week, right? The, right, the God, God's right hand is the strong one. We say in the Song of the Sea, right? You mean Hashem, Osachayil, it does great victory. The right of Hashem. So whenever we want to turn, whenever we're doing any turns, you should always turn to the right. It's a sign of you'll be successful, of, of, of strength. And so, so how do we translate that? In our ritual, when do you turn around in a circle? So one example is when the Chazan lifts up the Sefer Torah. It's not the Chazan, it's the person who does Hagba, the Magbiha, whoever lifts up the Sefer Torah. So 
Let me stand up and I'll give you a demonstration. Let's say this is the Torah. Okay, this is my beautiful tefillin. <laughs> I'm lifting up here the, the Torah. I'm lifting it up. I'm supposed to turn to my right. Which way should I turn? I should go like this? That's, that's what you think, because here's my right hand. So I'm going to go towards my right, and right, and right, right. Actually, when the Kohen <clears throat> was up on top of the altar, right, there's this corner, I'm not doing 3D, but you know what I mean. The Kohen would come up, here's the ramp. He would come up, and then he would turn to here. Go around here, go around here, and go around here. Is that turning to the right? Uh, it looks like he's making left turn, and a left turn, and a left turn, and a left turn. What's going on? Okay. Ah, so that's because you're looking at it from the perspective of the person who's holding, let's say he's holding some, whatever, you know, uh, a limb of an animal, or whatever it is. And I'm holding a sacred Torah, so I should turn to my right. But if you think about it, that he's facing here, here's, there was the fire in the middle. There was actually a few different, you know, uh, place for, for the animal. You always have to be facing inwards. So, mm. this is what I'm looking at. So, I'm going to go to my right. I'm going to go to my right around the, the altar, around the, the fire. I'm always going to go to my right. I'm following my right. Right? So I go to my right, to my right, to my right. That's the way I go around the altar. And so it works out. What works out is that it looks like I'm making a left turn, a left turn, a left turn. But really, if I'm always facing towards the middle part of what I'm focusing on, whether it's the altar or the Sefer Torah also, to turn to the right actually means I'm taking the Sefer Torah to the left. I hope you understood that. Right? It, it looks like I'm going to my left, but the reason why I'm doing it is because you are, the Sefer Torah is not with you, but it's in the middle. So you keep the Sefer Torah in the middle, and you are always moving to the right around the Sefer Torah. So actually, the proper way to do it is to, uh, what, what me and you would say is turn to the left. But uh, the truth is, there, there are a few traditions. And it's not absolute. Uh, some people uh, explain it the way I just explained it, based on the temple. We know that the Kohen would walk around in this direction, which to us looks like left turns, but actually it's called right turns. But the explanation is that if you're facing towards the middle, then you're always moving to your right. Um, but as other people say that we don't f pattern ourselves after the temple so much. And they actually do take the Sefer Torah and they turn to the right. Uh, so there's different customs. I don't think that uh, one is absolutely right and the other one absolutely wrong, mm -hmm. but uh, they're both uh, valid. Like, we are not Kohanim in the temple. Mm -hmm. So the, the, uh, we don't have to be following a very precise uh, regimen. Yes. Uh, it's, it's a custom to lift up the Sefer Torah and to show it to the people, mm -hmm. but the precise you know, order in which you show it is less uh, halachic obligation than it was in the temple. And, uh, but this is what the debate is based on. Okay. Interesting, yeah. Can I ask sure, more? sure. Okay. When, uh, By the way, we're going to be reading the Torah again at Mincha. Like on Mincha on Shabbat afternoon, we read the Torah. Mm -hmm. Also on a fast day, we read the Torah in the morning and in the afternoon. So me, for example, this morning, I didn't hear this Torah. I came to Davin Shacharit here thought I came early enough, and I was daven with the minyan. Over here, next to, next to Machon Meir, there's a shul where they daven right next to the park. Lovely place to daven. But I looked at the clock, and it was already 5 to 9. 
and they were, didn't even get up to the uh, Torah reading yet. So I had to leave. I had to come to be on, in Shir on time. <laughs> Ravid. <coughs> and uh, everybody else, we tried to make it on time. So I, so I left. I didn't hear the Torah reading this morning. But most, uh, you know, I, I'm consoling myself that we're going to read again this afternoon. In the Mincha prayer, we say the same Torah reading again with the 13 attributes of mercy from the Torah. Yes, go ahead, Ravid. What was the next question? I <coughs> Two questions. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Now you're pushing it. <laughs> the one who is holding up the Torah and turn around to the left and right. Yes. Uh, the place where I am used to go, we put up our seats. Mm. Make a circle and looking for the, the words in the in the Torah at the beginning where we need to start reading from the Torah. Uh, it is uh, typical for Sephardic people or is it also Ashkenazi? This is one question. The other question: Last Chamishi, uh, uh, the uh, man who took the Torah to take it to the Bima, he took it on his left shoulder. And I saw that and I said, this is not okay, but maybe I am wrong. So I, I'm going to ask this. Ah, okay. So you weren't here, I believe, on, on Thursday. No. Where we actually discussed this, believe it or not. Okay. <laughs> we talked about it. We said that uh, it's a custom to show greater respect for the Torah. It should be on your right-hand side. Right is associated with strength, but uh, it's not a violation. It's not a, it's not a, so it's not a law. So you need to correct him. That's right. It's okay. probably worse to, to make somebody embarrassed than it is to carry the Torah on your left-hand side. But the people like to tell people what to do. and They feel holy, and they feel like they're defending the faith. And so many times people are always telling the others what to do. If you do it wrong, do it this way. Mm-hmm. Probably, I, I, don't, I don't like it, but people are people. In terms of uh, kissing the Torah or, or pointing to it, so this is, again, the different customs, more in the Sephardic world than the Ashkenazi world. Mm-hmm. There is a precept in the, that's mentioned in the codes that when you, based on Kabbalah, that it's good to actually see the letters. Why are they lifting up the Sefer Torah? So you could see what's in there. But if you're so far away, you, it just looks like a blur. It's, it's not as good. Ideally, you should be actually being able to pinpoint at least one letter, if not a word, if not the beginning of the passage you're supposed to read, there's many different levels of, of stringency. But again, it's a custom, which is only in uh, some communities. There are some communities, they're very careful about it. It becomes a big deal. Everybody crowds in, peers in, tries to look to see the words. But um, it can be quite disruptive. <laughs> but in the safari uh, scene, it's more easy because you open the, the Torah and you put it up so everyone can read it. Well, everybody lifts it up. The question is whether, you know, how close, how small the shul it is, how big, if you have 100 people in the shul. You can't get 100 people within eyesight if you have glasses like I do, you know, right. unless you have a telescope. <laughs> <laughs> Binoculars in shul. I want to see those letters in the Zevi Torah. It's not a law. You don't have to. You're not, you're not, there's no obligation to see it at all. It, there, is, there is a Kabbalistic custom that seeing the letters of the holy Torah scroll have an influence on your soul. And so people get really into that. Yeah. And Somebody uh, told me when you do it, if you like to do it, you need to look for the first letter of your first name. That's right. That's right. Why is this? Again, this is all based on the Kabbalah. These ideas that you are connecting your soul to the Torah. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> and you just start the, the loop if it's a yeah. zit. Catch really? Yeah. Wow. Like you, look so you look through the loop in your TT. I've never heard that. That's, that's, that's nice. Wow. Yeah. Catching it. Okay. These are all symbolic moves. Of course, they, you know. Then there's the, some people. They they raise the pinky. Yeah, you don't yeah. have TT, so you raise the pinky and you, you point, and then you kiss your pinky. These are different customs. It all shows how much the Jewish people love the Torah, and. Uh, but don't get confused that this is like the law from Moses to Sinai. This is not a mitzvah. It's not, it, these, are, these, are, these are customs, which again, show how much we cherish the Torah. But um, 
don't, you know, some people, again, going back to what we said about telling others what to do, you could be violating more sins by trying to, you know, defend the dignity of the Torah. You'll see somebody with elbows. <laughs> I got to get in. I got to get in to see, to, to see my name in the Zebra Torah, but you stepped on my toe. <laughs> right? On the way, you're doing a violation of, you know, the respect for your neighbors. So it depends on the circumstances. There's some shuls where it's quite common. People are not crazy about their personal space uh, like they are in some countries. You know, they, they use uh, everybody's in, uh, on top of each other, like in the shuk. You know, everybody's very loud and close up to each other. So if that's the tradition, if that's the custom... That's normal, but in another place you go to a place where they come from Germany. Everybody's supposed to sit in their seat and not raise their voice. You don't even raise up your hand, your pinky, to raise up your pinky and point. We don't point at things, it's impolite. Didn't your mother ever tell you not to point at someone? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you want to know a story about the banana seed? Okay, banana seed, yeah. Uh, we grow up with the tradition that like when we are children, uh, our parents tell us don't point at the stars, because if you point at the stars, a mole will grow on your finger. A mole will grow on your finger. And the reason for that why is because at the end of Shabbat you count three stars. Right. Uh, but if we counted three stars and our neighbors saw it, they would know that we, we were keeping Shabbat. Right. So they would tell the inquisitors, and we it would get us killed. Right. So in, uh, instead of explaining to the child what was happening, 